This is not a recruitment podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Powered by People podcast. Today, we are honoured to welcome Gemma Lee, Chief People Officer of Conica Minolta. Thanks for joining us, Gemma. Um, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Gemma Lee. So my current role is Chief People Officer at Conica Minolta, as you've just said. Um, key focus for me is everything people related. Amazing. So I look after the complete full remit of the Conica Minolta organisation in the UK in reference to people engagement, people recognition, people development, people acquisition, culture, not solely my responsibility, obviously, but a, a real focus on how we are the best organisation we can be for our people. Culture obviously impacts all of those other topics, doesn't it? Considerably. If you've got a terrible culture, you're not going to be able to acquire many people um, or develop people or, you know, engagement is going to be low. So, yeah, it's a, um, a core topic. And one that we sort of talked about that, that could potentially be a, a focus for us today because I think it's such an, an, a big, hot topic in lots of businesses at the moment. And particularly for some of the companies that are looking, Conoco Minolta is an enormous organisation, um, for some of the companies that are looking to, in that sort of growth phase, how they can position themselves to, to sort of be a, 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 a big business with a, with a culture that sort of fits, I suppose. You've been there for 10 years or so? Just under, yeah. So several different roles throughout that time. Only in the position I'm in currently, Chief People Officer, for just over um, 12 months. So this is quite a new new focus for me, which has been really interesting. Um, it's interesting what you say about culture, because one of the things that I was thinking when you were saying that is also how much the post-pandemic situation and choice-based working has affected. Yeah culture and it's probably an area I would say is now being so readily discussed within the certainly within HR and people networks I sit in is how you maintain a culture or how you foster a culture yeah. if you have people working in a variety of different ways I think yeah. that's quite an interesting extra yeah. dimension to the discussion around workplace culture I, th I think as well um, and Obviously, talking about the cultural identity of the businesses that we've worked in, and obviously we've known each other for a long time, we've worked in, we both worked for Conoco and Elsa. Um, but before we get into that, which we'll get right into now, <laughs> um, when we're talking about culture, and I think it's, it, it is a hot topic, but it's also become a bit as a throwaway buzzword. I think I think you can, back in sort of early two thousands, like greenwashing was the thing, right? It, it was an environmental agenda. Yep. You could plant a couple of trees, put a tick in a box and you're done. I think now culture is kind of becoming a bit like that. I think you can culture wash a business by saying, you got we make the table. Yeah, we make this joke all the time. Like culture is more than a fruit bowl on a ping pong table yeah. in the toilet, right? Than the level of snoodle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got to have an office dogs have a good culture. Yes. So it'd be interesting to hear from you, like how you personally and professionally define culture. Like what is it? mean deep to you deep. yeah i mean we've gone we're only five minutes in we've just, that's what it's got the fight we've, in. Got we've gone right in i think do you know what the the interesting thing here probably like frame it slightly differently is what would i define it as not in the to your point there if you asked a lot of i get you could call them cultural specialists or if you talked about cultural change programs that might be you know presented to you from a consultancy agency yeah. of how you could reshape a culture or how you could advance your culture the reality of that being that that culture is a is a combination of of people, their behaviours, and what they do, yeah, and what's yeah. acceptable and what's not acceptable. In which case, you can't really dictate that, shape it, or manipulate it as much as a book or a theorist might have you believe. And I think yeah. the interesting part about that too is that mm. the desire often for organisations, whether that's a young tech startup or an advanced corporate, is to have one culture. Well, that's not realistic either. Yeah. Because if you don't have one type of person working there, which ideally, if you've got diversity of thought and you want to advance your business, you don't want Should. the same people. Yeah. So you will have subcultures within your culture. And that's also absolutely, absolutely great. Absolutely fun. It's about how does that all accumulate to the business goal, business, goal, business yeah. values? Yeah. And how does that fundamentally mean that people are 
connected in some way together to get the same outcome. It doesn't mean they have to do it in the same way or be the same people. I think one of the biggest parts for me that's critical to workplace culture that we needed a long time ago and we didn't have, and we absolutely are developing in lots of, is about inclusivity. Yeah. So it is about how do you encourage all the voices in your organization to have a say in what it is you're trying to do and they be connected to it. Yeah. And that's a difficult thing to achieve because most organizations, certainly existing corporates, have hierarchy. Yeah. For obvious reasons, authority matrices, decision making processes. That are hard to break down Absolutely. and start again with your yeah. yeah. And it's interesting, I had a debate uh, quite a while ago with 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 a external consultancy I was talking to about can you reshape a culture? So obviously there's lots of examples, your business, when you start something from the beginning, yeah. you can decide how you would like to recruit, yep. what values you would like to promote. How do you do that with existing organizations? And is there any true success stories of where you take a culture that existed to be completely different over a period of time? Yeah. And I think there are. And I think we've got examples at Konica Minolta of evolution. But cultural change is difficult because it's people change. That's the reality. Yeah. yeah. And often... And also with large and existing businesses, it, it can some, somewhat depend on what that business is. Mm. You know, you, you're not going to, if it's a construction organization, there may be nuances to each business that you're just not going to be able to impact because it's the people. And that there might be a type of person within that organization that you're not going to be able to change. Um, so I think that's really interesting. And also like the best definition of culture I've ever seen. Yeah. Nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. And the the idea of, of subcultures is something that we've sort of discussed loads. We, mm. Within the Rec Hub, we have what we call communities and uh, we're a remote first business. And what we were very aware of is that having one culture probably wasn't going to work. Mm. And instead, we wanted people to connect with each other on whatever level interest that interests them. So we have different communities in order to, to, to sort of connect people in different ways and and that in its way is forming its own cultures within the own subcultures within the business I, I think that's what you said just then about kind of letting the culture shape itself almost that was very much our intention from the beginning wasn't it yeah we've always said that you cannot enforce a culture i think you can put a framework around it and you can highly appropriately yeah, recruit it into it but it has to grow organically it has to grow from the ground up and I think our really kind of postage stamp definition of culture is feeling like you belong. Yeah. If you can feel like you belong somewhere, whether that's because you have relationships with people or shared interests or that peer group is aligned to some values of yours, then I think ultimately you start to feel like you belong in that business. That's a high value. inclusivity piece, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And, and that, that for me, one of the biggest lessons I've learned over the years is if you think about inclusivity, that also includes understanding people who maybe have different values to you or mm. value something different at work. So if I take a more traditional business, for me, I would struggle with people being really connected to a corporate dress code or yeah. having their own car parking space in a car park due to hierarchy. Things like that have baffled me historically and I've had some really good other angles presented to me that says you know that's not important to you but if for a person in the organization they really value being in a three-piece suit because that matters to how they present themselves and they're part of your organization you have to understand their their view of that yeah. too yeah. and that perspective and obviously there's some limitation to that if people value something that is disruptive and toxic to your culture that's a different yeah. approach but yeah. really letting everyone belong doesn't does does mean that right yeah. so and, and i think when you have organizations that have different types of needs in terms of the people that work there so you might have a manufacturing arm of the business you might have a operational business office element they, they would be different types of people with different desires from their career and different yeah. cultures exactly. within those those business units exactly. even yeah. and that all needs to exist holistically together in an ideal world for the business to be successful and i think that Nobody comes to work to do a bad job. That's my, no. my thing. Yep. It, it can be misaligned and that can affect your culture. And you, you definitely can have cultural toxic people that yep. are disrupting the way you want your business to progress from the inside. And that that is something that needs to be addressed by leaders and, and businesses if you, yeah. if you want that to change. But how people turn up to work and therefore how your culture is impacted is 
it's one of the most important things in business, which is not necessarily still in this day and age considered as much as it should be. I mean, there is the uh, the Drucker comment that strategy, culture eats strategy for breakfast. breakfast. And people will roll that out. But if you actually look at organizations, most investment when they start is not necessarily in how people are being treated within the workplace and how they prioritize that, people's development, their engagement, their connection. It will be about connecting sales, all the things that, that mean yeah. the, the profit and the business has been and will be successful. So I'll always, I'll always debate that with lots of people that will talk. Well, it's, really, it's such an interesting one, really, uh, Gemma. Uh, uh, have you read The Happiness Advantage? No. It's a fantastic book. Um, and it's it sort of um, it debates that 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 sort of that topic in which do you become successful, which equals happiness, or does happiness equal success? Um, and uh, and actually, you know, through the research that this I can't remember the author for the life of me, but from the for the research that he goes and and talks to lots and lots of different businesses across the globe, the the, the sort of overwhelming uh, evidence is that. The happier you are in yourself, in your organization, in your workplace, in your personal life, the more successful you will be. If you are chasing success to achieve happiness, you're always chasing happiness because you're 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 never you're never you know comfortable with what you've got because there's you're always going to be a void. There's it? always something that you're chasing, yeah. and that that equals your happiness. So, actually, understanding uh, or having a workplace in which people are happy to start with is potentially going to you know enable you to be a successful organization um rather than that that, that sort of throws that drucker comment a little bit well i think upside down thinking about ben's point earlier as well around you know it, it isn't also about the the belonging piece is really important to, yeah. to most people but that hasn't been historic so mm. there's a lot of people in the workplace that will have been there for the majority of their career without necessarily the people consideration that we have seen in the last decade i would say even more so in the last three to four years in particular yeah. so it's actually quite an alien concept to a lot of working people for someone to be interested as to whether they're individually recognized seen and heard in their workplace yeah and actually for some people that's a bit much like yeah. so actually that that that, that, that yeah. could feel intrusive that yeah. could feel so from that perspective that isn't necessarily Again, to Ben's point earlier, if you are just, if you are dictating this wonderful culture that you decide the business needs to have and you will do via different methods that you bring in, could be recognition programs, could be slides in the office, thinking of yeah. the silicone uh, roundabout version of, yeah. of that and the tech companies that led that. The reality is that most people want to feel valued for what they do yep. when they are working. They need to see an opportunity for them and also the reality for almost every human being is they turn up at work with a hell of a lot of other stuff that's happened and is outside of work yep. that impacts who they are their values and what they need from life and i think to your point there around happiness and success the interesting part around the success piece there is what does success look like for different people there is a there's a very narrow view of what success looks like in particularly in capitalist and Western society. Yeah, yeah. And and that's what most people are measuring it against without intrinsically thinking, what do I actually think about that? 100%. Yeah, so, that's a really good point. I think that's changed a little bit, but that <clears throat> how endemic social media is and the kind of the facade of success that comes with the material trappings of success. Like, I think I'm starting to feel there is a bit of a, a shift in that like the the culture around de-influencing at the moment and mm. kind of moving away to more authentic and organic sources of content like i do think that the traditional western values of success is starting to drop a little bit i think yeah um, maybe people are more i don't know inward, inwardly looking now and now there's more culture around self-love and kind of protecting yourself i think that's that is change i feel maybe that is changing a little bit i don't know i think well i think one of the huge advantages of social media and we could probably have a whole nother conversation about what could be disadvantages certainly on account of teenage children but um i think the huge advantage of social media is it connects communities it pr provides platforms for people to talk and if you think about a channel like this it creates conversation yeah, yeah. and if people are having conversations they haven't had before with different people or they're listening to alternative views they might not have had access to 
invariably people start to think more for themselves and about what they want and not mm -hmm. just be marketed to yep. or think I, I must feel like I want to do that because really what that marketer wants me to do is buy that product yeah. and actually that's influencing then whether I feel loved whether I like myself whether I am good yeah. with my family but actually if you start to ask yourself those questions and you're having conversations like you just described you're actually thinking about your own version of that rather than the wider view of it yeah, it also it also puts the onus on the the person having the or the people having those conversations and how honest and authentic they're being because if they're not, and they're you know they're they're incredibly unhappy and they're you know they're they're um, in in a, a dark place. But in this conversation, they're like, yeah, I'm super successful and I've got all of these things and they make me really happy. Then you're asking yourself potentially the wrong questions because you're listening to somebody who isn't necessarily being. Uh, truthful I think that's potentially where, where you're sort of talking about that facade of of social media and you know you see you see the best of people potentially on on social media rather than some of the, the darker sides of it yeah well I think it's, it's as a platform it's just gonna it's polarizing right because yeah the whole point of social media is to to generate traction or to elicit a response right whether that's a like or a comment so I think it's always and I'm definitely not anti-social media that in my role, I use it every day. Channel, um, channel. Yeah, and it is, but it is a it's an incredibly polarizing channel because yeah. you want to put content out, regardless if it's a B two B or a B two C or whatever. You're going to put content out that elicits that response. So it's either going to be the absolute best or the absolute worst middle of the road content that isn't going to elicit any kind of positive or negative response. Is it going to gain traction? Is it going to tick the algorithm that the social media platform wants you to do in order to promote that content? So it's, I guess it's always going to be, you're always going to see the best and the worst, right? And I think that comes back to, you, you again, you said earlier on about the, the point around, you know, culture. And for me, that disruption you're talking about there yeah. is, is really important in that, again, if you, if you, if you looked at a book and you thought about culture and you went on a business course or any of the, the, the really relevant things you can, you can do, the chances are it would be positioning the importance of the positive element of it yeah right? and you said it yeah. what is culture you you mentioned at the start well for me there's there's the bit that you might say a company is and then there's a really a good image actually that's like an iceberg and it's like all the stuff above it yeah that says these are the company values this yeah. is the brand this is our policies this is our practices our procedures etc but underneath is what everyone's really doing yeah, yeah, yeah. right which actually dictates really we what it feels like to work yeah. at the company yeah. and for me that's another part that we've 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 addressed a few times throughout here is about you know it doesn't need to be perfect either right and so being honest about a company's culture no company's culture will be perfect because perfection doesn't exist yeah and it just, certainly it's, doesn't it's, it's a constant yeah constant yeah it, it, work in progress isn't it yeah. and and it's, it's always evolving exactly and and it's very important about why does it matter to business well it's about the alignment of is your culture enabling an environment where the business is progressing and evolving yeah. and staying relevant if it's just an awesome culture, but the business is tanking, yeah. then it's the the culture's misaligned to what the business goals are, isn't it? As yeah. actually, and I, yeah. I think that's going looking at your current role and, and how you've that's a very nice transition. Um, I think the Conica Minolta now um, is obviously a very different one to the one that we shared six, seven, however many years ago, um, and I think that the culture when I was there was definitely one of performance and drive and the the kind of perceived successes that came with being a sales orientated organization but it's very different now right and i think obviously you've had to not reverse engineer it but kind of layer some different elements of the culture of the business and the how the business makes people feel um i was going to say how have you done that but that's a very big question <laughs> What, what kind of orchestra the last ten years? Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I guess let's make it make it relevant to people that might be listening. So, for a business maybe looking to um, have an inward view or turn the lens on themselves in terms of their own cultural identity, what 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 other kind of steps you would go if you thought right, we need to make some changes here. We need to people are telling us we need to change. What are those? What's kind of like the the base level things that people could do? And this is a massive question. But I think, I, I guess when I was listening to you speak there, I think also it's a natural evolution, right? So, so many things over a decade have helped that progression. Yeah. The 
changing the environment so the business had to be different as an example so yeah. it had to be about COVID, in, right? yeah it had to be about innovation it had to be about transformation it had to yeah. be about evolution because actually what we traditionally sold and how we made money is fundamentally had a shelf life and therefore yeah. needed to be different yeah. but in terms of the people part i mean i think there's there's key elements to it is probably the most simplest way is what do you reward for yeah. And what do you challenge, right? So yeah. if it is makes perfect sense to behave a certain way in an organization, which then affects you positively in in a sales environment for you, that if you're rewarded handsomely for behaving and acting in a certain way, but that's yeah. not conducive to a positive working culture in other methods, those behaviors don't tend to change for anyone if you're getting a good pat on the back and, and yeah. it looks great. Yeah. Um, so the definitely recognition of of Someone once said, you focus on what you would hire for, but what would you fire for is another way to angle at it. And I wouldn't quite move into that. We're not in America. But the reality of it is, what, what, how are you doing well in an organization will tend to dictate how people do or don't behave within the workplace. That, that's the, the quite solid part of it. For me, the much more effective and subtler part is around what, what is it that this company stands for? What, what do we want to be and how does leadership develop that mm. how does it feel good for the people that are in that environment and when it doesn't look like what you want it to look like what actually happens what is the consequence of that so it, it really for me is about people being people I easily identifying that if I do this here this is great if I do this here this isn't great I'm being really clear and I suppose to step back from your question you have to be clear what you want the good to look like yeah. and what the bad means yeah. right and and that takes time because the reality of it is it's tough to have a conversation with, it might be that you, you had to not deal with a customer because they actually well, stand for something that is not aligned mm -hmm. to the ethics of your organization yeah. or is offensive to people within the organization. And that's really difficult to turn yeah. away cash. Exactly. Yeah. And so as well internally, you might have some absolute superstars that deliver everything that you need, but they make it really difficult for others to work with them. Uh, yeah, we've often referred to those people like um, toxic, they're, they're high performing toxic right so it's almost like they're like a cancer you can't get rid of them they're just always there they're uh, but you, well you can can you get rid of them that's the question because they're incredibly you typically in sales environments that i've been in high performing generating lots of revenue but crashing everyone else around them and does the business thrive <clears throat> you know maybe there's a dip when they leave you get rid of them but then the, the rest of the, everyone else around them comes up because that they don't have that toxicity around them. And I think a really ideal thing that is is what you want is it, it ideally people should see why do I want to be here? So there are there are there are methods that might need to be adopted and that is a change in people, but if you change everything over time around everyone, people tend to make their own choice about this isn't fun for me anymore. I used to do all of this and then nothing good happens when I do that. And actually, the people who used to hang out with me doing that, they're not listening either because mm. they actually like the nicer way. I'm just going to use a term like that. It's a beautiful term, but the nicer way of working. And I think alongside everything that has happened in the last decade, how you go about being successful and thriving doesn't need to be harsh and, you know, use, you use words like targeted performance. They're very... I use they're very masculine words in the yeah. sense of that that a lot of the way business has been seen to be successful is work all the hours that you can, take no prisoners, be individualistic, et cetera. Exactly. And the reality of it is that the world has changed quite considerably. Yeah. And the expectation of people joining the workplace now, if you use a younger generation, is not to be have a dictatorial leader. That that leadership style is obsolete, in yeah. my opinion. And if it's not in some organizations, it will be sued. And, and people aren't hiring that type of management team and drivers of business. And I think there are so many elements that do need to be addressed if you want to, to shift and change a culture. I also think controversially, it's a very difficult thing to turn a culture around in large corporate organizations. Yes. Mm. From, I definitely think it's very difficult to look at it was something and then it's something entirely different. It's a much more subtle evolution than that that you can only step back over a really long period of time and just see how different it is in the moment certainly i would in my role still see all the things we still need to do yeah. which i think is what is in, is interesting in lots yeah. of ways and i think in current times probably the one of the most interesting parts in the last 
I would say, particularly in the last five years, with keen focuses, the inclusivity element. Yeah. How do you make people feel included? Yeah. And recognize that an organization that is completely and wholly made up of one type of person mm. was completely acceptable and is acceptable still in many companies. It, it just doesn't work if you want to diversify the thinking of the organization. Yes. Someone said you're like 70% more likely to hire someone that looks like you. And so actually creating um, uh, interview processes that break all of those things down um, are, are so important mm. because otherwise you just fall into that trap. It's your unconscious bias. Or just biases. Um, well, I was talking to a, a, um, I was talking to a, uh, a lady who is a DNI sort of specialist. Um, and she said a lot of the challenges that companies face are based around that their focus is on the diversity element mm -hmm. and like, oh, let's, you know, let's, let's create, uh, let's go do unconscious bias training and make sure that people interviewing, uh, you know, are more centered and, and people in TA organizations are more centered around, uh, you know, building diverse pipelines. But then if you're not focusing on the inclusivity part, the moment you build a diverse workforce, if they don't ha feel included in your organization, they don't hang around long. Absolutely. So actually focusing on the inclusivity piece can can almost give you an organic um, uh, diversity piece later on. Um, but how do we make people feel included? I suppose that's the, the biggest question is how, how, do, how do we do that? I think one of the things for me, and again, when you mentioned earlier around, if, if you hire somebody, and then the minute they're there, you ask them to be anything that was not part of why you hired them. Yeah. That's kind of like a bit of a difficult challenge straight away. So yeah. it, to your point, if you want to have diversity of thought, so you want to hire difference, yeah. but then once you have hired difference, as soon as that person speaks up in a meeting with an alternative opinion, five other people look surprised, shocked and disagree yeah. and encourage them to think the same as the you. The same as you. <laughs> You have completely ignored Lost. the reason as to why. Like, and, and that person, as an example, probably wouldn't feel like they belong. I think over the years, I've asked myself a lot about, i.e., what do I think matters to me and why I belong and why would other people feel it? And I I still still baffle over it. But I think one yeah. of the key component parts is being listened to and heard. Mm. So if you are in an organisation where there isn't an opportunity for you, either in your direct relationship with whoever you work with in yep. peer teams or your leader or or bigger than that the chances are you'll get fed up quite quickly yeah. even if other things work out quite well because most people even if they're very introverted extroverted or whatever term they they want to contribute to yeah. what they're doing and I think that's becoming more and more the case as well and if that isn't encouraged in an organization and fostered and not just I mean, I, I'm not against employee surveys. It's a fantastic way to find out the pulse of your organization. But why don't they act? Right, exactly. If they're actually, but also if somebody tells you something you didn't want to hear, that's good feedback too. It's the best, if anything. Yeah. So it's, it's not the way to make sure that you can ensure everybody is happy and engaged, and there's no alternative to that. Listening to people is not the same as listening to people, if that makes sense. Yeah. The, it, there's a difference in how you listen properly. And that's key, I think, to belonging. That's maybe the difference for me. Definitely. Well, that is, that's definitely been the case that organisations I've worked in and we'll, we'll be sitting around a, a table going through employee satisfaction surveys. And you naturally <laughs> gravitate to the things that make you feel good as a leader, right? So people call out, great stuff about culture or great stuff about incentives and you think, yeah, we're doing a good job. And there might be one comment that you don't want to hear. That is not so, not in our business. I think we prioritize those. those I was going to say, yeah, those, but, yeah, we often previously, so, oh, it's only one, it doesn't matter. But nine out of the 10 are really good, but there's only one that's a bit negative. So we don't need to worry about that. But back to our point about belonging, it takes a lot, of, even if it's anonymous or not, right? It takes a lot of guts to, to say something that, potentially people don't want to hear what you And it's still your opinion. hundred right? percent. It might not be one you like or agree with, but it is it's valid to that person. Definitely. And that is um that one negative comment or that one feeling, um, that is helping shape your we've not really got onto employer brands yet, but that is shaping internally your employer brand, right? And your internal culture and how people feel within your organization. We're right, you can never 
please everybody, right? Like you, you, we just can't in, in any size business, whether it's five or 5,000, but everyone needs to have that voice and feel like they're heard and acted on, right? Yeah. And I think you mentioned as well about sort of polarization earlier when you're talking about social media. And I think that can be similar in a workplace, particularly if companies are going through large stages of evolution or transformation. There can be, are you on the bus or you're not on the bus? Are you in this with us? Or are you not in this with us? And and actually, that can be quite polarizing too, because change is difficult for people. And in order for people to be comfortable with change, you have to understand what they value and how you show them the future would still align to what they value. Yeah, yeah. And or, as I said earlier, it can be that it won't ever, and that's okay, but that person needs to be in an adult decision then to make their choices. Otherwise, they're never going to feel good about that. But I think there can be times where you have unhappy disgruntled people through the evolution in organizations mm. that you can work with and they come along and they're some of your best advocates yeah. when you go through those stages yeah. but it can be polarized if you think they're not on board they need to go they are on board they're our future and actually the most challenging part of people leadership in any business is how do you respond to the multitude of difference that you have right and and that for me is an, an ongoing battle, I think. And yeah. thinking about your question earlier as well about how do we enact that type of change, I think you have to really, to do a job like mine and other people I know and hugely respect that have done it prior and and other people I know within networks I'm in, you have to really, really care about people. Yeah. If you don't, re if you're not really interested in people, you don't really, that's a passion, I think, if yeah. you really want to be influential in cultural change in organizations i think that's quite key i was just sitting here thinking we you never really see much in training development or you know workshopping around empathy um and actually you know that that seems to be the key to uh, creating cultural change because what you're suggesting is that people in in, in the, the ideal world you need people to really understand someone else's perspective you know, in that example where you've, you know, you've uh, somebody who you've hired for diversity of thought is in a room full of people that then just shoot them down for that for that thought, but they're potentially not understanding where that person's coming from or the perspectives that they may have and how those perspectives may benefit the organisation in the long run. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, I don't, do you see that much much training around empathy and actually? There's more. I think there's definitely more we've talked about now there's more conversation there's more yeah um there's more understanding of different skills i mean what's interesting not that long ago and probably still in lots of ways people would describe what you you're talking about as a soft skill yeah so people skills are considered to be soft skills i've always found that really offensive yeah, the simple fact that most people are so absolutely terrible at these skills tells me they're not soft in the slightest <laughs> So from that perspective, I think that's always quite fascinating. You know, it's people who are good with people and mm, they're good, you know, and, and in truth, as a female, that's often no, more aligned to female uh, leadership, yeah. female behaviors. And, and some of that actually is true because of caregiving and other, other work, and I will call it work, that has sat more with women than it has with men traditionally still does. That, but leadership in its truest form to be effective, in my view, and therefore influencing culture in a positive way, to have a level a huge level of empathy yeah. in, involved in it and being empathetic is not natural for everyone and it's not also something that's not been encouraged it's in fact been discouraged in the world for many years because yeah. 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 if you consider whether the person you've just asked to stay and do something till the early hours of the morning is actually impacting their at-home relationship is tired is close to burnout. If you actually think from their perspective, you're not going to drive those numbers. Yeah. So from that, that and, long, and and then also the impact on you as a leader in that sense. So I might achieve this next one target by dry burning that person into the ground. Short term, but short termism, yeah, because then because you know they're going to burn out or leave, and then I've got a massive gap to fill, and actually is missing that that small target there going to impact the the longer term. Yeah. Um, uh, benefits. Yeah, it's really interesting. I've just always we we actually have a a focus um, on developing soft skills as opposed to hard skills because often, and I, you're, I'm the same as you. I hate the, even the terminology soft and hard skills. Crucial skill. Crucial, Crucial skill. skill. They're life skills. You know, like um, having empathy is going to develop 
somebody's relationships outside of work and inside of work, um, but also having a, a, a broader, deeper sort of soft skill set um, is, is going to impact your entire framework for learning, not just this, I can now sell this, or I can now write in this way, or I can now use this uh, tool, um, but having a, a deeper and broader s set of soft skills is going to enable you to be a better learner, to be a better uh, employee, to be a better friend and colleague yeah. and leader. Yeah. But I think there's two there's two key parts as well you've mentioned there that also for me are very relevant to it. Again, fostering a really positive culture and that's learning. So yeah. having an active learning culture as a premise of your organization is also another very effective way in my view that you foster development in people and if people have a learning mindset that means they a don't think they know it all and also they're more willing to learn from others and that doesn't mean learning from everyone above you hierarchically yeah. actually look left look right what what, Everywhere. what is is available to you and then the other part of wealth for me is about the fail fast piece right and i know that's hugely overused term in the in in today's world but is it okay to fail and what happens when you do culturally is very 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 important to how people feel at work so negative cultures i've i've seen i've been part of blame is a real root of a lot of the problems yeah. i.e we're all right if everyone's succeeding but if anybody did something wrong, yeah that, that that becomes a place of humiliation or a place of concern yeah. and often that couples really up if i take it from a hr perspective people being fearful of losing a job yeah, yeah. even though in my experience there's ever very little evidence that ever happens in a, in most uk cultured organizations it's not that easy to fire people yeah um but <laughs> there's still that fear that people have that drives then some very odd behaviors that are normally quite toxic to an organization yeah so one of the the key things for me with the development i've seen in leadership is if at the higher levels if you have a hierarchical structure if it's really evident that learning is really important and failing is okay. That's a really good start culturally yeah, yeah. for a successful, thriving organization. But it can't just be said, it has to be what's experienced. Because what is so important for culture is that, like we've said, it's not what you write down on paper, it's actually how everyone behaves. So even just choose flexibility is a great example. If you say we've got a really flexible culture, but you're a, a father or a mother with young children at home and you never leave the office, what you're telling other young parents in the organization or working parents is, I know I've said you can, but this is what I do. It's much more effective using my CEO as an example. Yeah, using my CEO as an example. He's got a young family. I've got a young family. And I know that he flexes in order to be the father he wants to be. Yeah. Similarly, I truly believe I can be that. And as a working mother in particular, that hasn't always been the case historically with 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 some leadership that, and cultures. I've that's heard. really developed in recent years, hasn't it? Really, and and I think the last two leaders for me particularly have really shaped that for me. And and understanding the boundaries you can put yourself in place. I mean, we discussed it last time we met Ben and I, but I can't believe I used to do the things I did with young children right at the start of my career. Yeah, but it was culturally what had you was you had no other option. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm so pleased for generations now i hope for most working cultures that that is a different view and that is shaping organizations of the future as awful as covid was it did fast track some uh, some initiatives that were already sort of in motion um uh, particularly around flexibility because mm -hmm. a lot of organizations didn't realize they could <laughs> yeah um i mean uh, banks had to find a way for people to operate from home um, in, in, in scenario like where people they just never would have made that investment uh, traditionally. And yeah, I think it, it's, it's fast track the ability for us to, to see a, a world in which it's okay to have way more flexibility than, yeah. than we did before. And I think, I mean, people always talk about like balance, don't they? I, I've never found that the, most, the best term because I've found that at different times, it doesn't balance, no. it rarely balances. I prefer work-life harmony. Yeah. That I can kind of make it work yeah. the best that I can because sometimes as a working parent, there'll be more that's needed in holidays, as an example, with yep. children, and there'll be more at work that's needed. And also, I love work, in which case that's a key part of what I want to do as well. Yeah. So you don't have to choose one or another, ideally. You have to work out a way. There hasn't got to be that balance. Actually, if they're both operating together as one, 
you can achieve your sort of life ambitions mm -hmm. if you like um yeah I, I love i much prefer work-life harmony i think yeah. that's a, a, a nice coined term um a couple of things i was i was um going to ask is one of the things that we've talked a little bit about previously particularly in in making people feel included is uh you know very simple things that people can can operate with as a business so like emi share schemes or employee ownership trusts have you worked with these before do you find that they actually do they in you know do they add to that level of feeling included not personally been involved in in how that specifically impacts employees in the workplace in in the companies i've worked for i've been to a lot of events where often the highest winning employee engagement uh companies have the partnership element yeah. of investment because obviously it's part of then you are if we go back to am i adding value am i connected am i am i here yeah. then if you're a part of that then that's that's ideally how you yes, would yes. think of yeah. yeah this exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. reference yeah there's a there's a reason why that's a highly engaged workforce yeah. and you know there's other i know other um examples of companies similar or same that have seen the same success um so yes i would i would argue not with a lot of knowledge but the, yeah. the, the premise of where we're coming from that makes sense right? it makes sense yeah. ultimately it's about having a shared vision right yeah i think it's connected isn't yeah. it if you yeah. feel like as an organization regardless of role or hierarchy you are contributing you're seen you're valued because you are tangibly making a difference then it it, it can only be a good thing right yeah um, providing it's not used as a stick to beat you with or used to incentivize different people in different elements which again that quite often happens right like people For sure. are yeah. overperforming are celebrated until they're not overperforming. yeah back to, back to Gemma's point about what are you re recognizing what are you rewarding what are you challenging right yeah and, and I think as well it's also it's hard right recognition because it might not always be your day and it might not always be your year right so I've seen with you and I've been involved with lots of recognition programs but I find recognition a fascinating subject because I'm a whole nother conversation <laughs> but the the simple part for me around it when you're in a really recognized place, right, that feels really good. Yeah. So say you have an annual scheme and people are recognized. It is great for the 11 people, say that volume, that have been, they are the top winners. They go up on stage. But it's pretty rubbish for anybody that is really knows the less. So, yeah. so the recognition schemes are an interesting concept because they include and they exclude. So they do a cracking job for the volume of people you recognise, but you could argue... It actually has a negative impact on, on everybody it, else. Exactly. But coming back to your empathy point, if you drive an understanding around recognition recognition being, I'm proud to recognise others as well as I am to be someone that's recognised, then you can be pleased for the people when it's not you, but you know it might be your day another day. Mm -hmm. That's quite a, a better way to go through it. And there's quite a few different ways recognition platforms look at that, where it's yeah. about the praiser as well as the person who's being... The praisee and the praiser, yeah. because it also feels really good to make someone else feel good. Yes. Yeah. So some of the pieces for me again around cultural attributes and looking for how you drive that is that it's it's great to help other people. You don't have to always be winning. You could be helping someone else to succeed. Yeah. And actually, there's tons of studies that show if you're feeling pretty rubbish, working with someone else feeling pretty rubbish and making them feel better has a really positive effect on you. So if you have a more community mentality and you think about what you're contributing for everyone, not just for yourself, that can have a great deal of impact. So I think that's an interesting part to weave into recognition. I think that's amazing. I think that's really important. I think businesses, um, and probably particularly ones that we've worked in, um, have often got recognition and reward very confused. Yes. I, I know they're kind of both sides of the same coin almost, but the, the feeling that that reward compared to recognition can evoke and the feeling in others um i think that's when it the water starts to get a little bit muddy right yeah and pay is an interesting example of that right again a whole nother level of if you ask a lot of people what would they well i would go there if, if i got a huge pay rise i'd be happy at work or it would be for about might span a few months yeah but but it's it's proven reward overall is proven to be short-lived yeah. isn't yeah. it that I was going to say, prime example is we see this quite often in a counter offer in employment, right? Mm. Yeah, someone will be offered a counter by their existing business to stay. Chances are that person will still is still going to leave within a year, probably, probably within six months because mm. they're still not addressing that. If you're only moving to money, which maybe used to be the case, that's definitely not now, but then you're still back to your original point. There's still going to be a void that isn't going to be filled, right? A very um, 
reputable source, which I haven't, I can't remember, um, but I'm sure it was reputable. It's very reputable, yeah. Super, yeah. definitely. Um, just trust me. <laughs> um, uh, is uh, the number one reason people move is for development, not for money. Um, because and and you know that's part of that feeling. Uh, feeling developed is is way more important than a few extra pounds in your pocket. If you, back to that sort of happiness and success debate: is do you feel happier when you're 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 feeling developed? You're learning something new. You're you're excited about the possibilities and opportunities that that development can give you, rather than a few extra pennies in your pocket. Um, albeit everyone loves a few extra pennies in their pocket, it's a difficult one to, to sort of um, look at. But I think you're absolutely right. If you accept a counter offer, the likelihood is you're still going to leave the organization unless the counter offer addresses some of the main concerns that you're, you're, you're leaving. If it's development opportunities, if it's a, a culture and that they can convince you that they're making active changes within the culture to support your, what you're looking for. If it's just a financial counter offer, there, there's usually many, many other reasons why someone's looking to leave an organization. Yeah. And I think the other element too, as well, is around what people value. I think that is shif has shifted, like you've mentioned, post-pandemic. In, in A great example for me is you were saying about lots of companies now have choice-based working or have flexible working, but I read a lot and see a lot about some reverting back now, right? There's, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. very expensive buildings. Elon's, Elon's made that accept. Yeah. <laughs> and using London as a great example on our doorstep right now, London is full of very large, very expensive properties that used to house hundreds of employees that are now empty, empty and yeah. they cost a lot of money. Yeah. And it's critical for people to 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 question what do we do, etc. So there's a lot being written um about in the critical nature of culture of being in an office and having anchor days and being in three days a week. And some of it's really relevant, I think. Yeah. But primarily what the negative impact can be, coming back to what we said about people wanting to belong, feeling individually recognized, etc., is you're telling me what to do again. Yeah. We we got away from this. We had a pandemic. I showed you that I could have a dog. I could be at home. I could have flexibility. And now you're telling me I've got to be back in again for three days. Even if I agree with you, even if I'm happier. I love going to the gym. I love seeing my mates. You've told me what to do again. Yeah. I thought we'd got past it. Yeah. And I think that's another key part for me. Treat adults as adults. Yeah. They come to work. They're an adult. And, and I think the same goes to young businesses that are full of younger people. Um, you know, if you're if you look at recruitment as an example, a, a lot of agencies hire super, you know, out of graduate, you know, graduates that are just literally fresh from university. Um, and in that sense, developing new skills is really quite difficult mm. when you're not in an office. You're when you're surrounded by uh, people, your your learning curve is going to be so much more um, uh, aggressive because you're you're learning from individuals around you. Um, if I can't imagine be going back 15 years to being in a recruitment, a new recruitment job and learning from home, I would have done absolutely fuck all. Mm. Um, because you just, you, you, firstly, I've, I've got ADHD, so I'm just all over the place anyway. But learning new skills in sitting at home and for a lot of people that have moved to London to, to sort of, you're in a, a you're in a, a, either a flat share or a one bed. And that can be quite isolating as well, you know? Yeah. So I think it's really interesting the dynamic of how different organizations are adjusting and changing. I mean, um, it comes to Ben's point around choice, I think, for me. I mean, I can only speak for, for our, our current situation at Conic Minolta. We have what we call choice-based working. Yeah. That means we provide a choice, which means we do have hubs and offices. Yeah. So there is a, a partnership option that we have, which means you can access other people and buildings and we do have some fixed office locations and then you have the choice and variance we have some roles where that's different because of the need to be on site for the specific job but we have then addressed well what does that choice look like for that group of people then how yeah. do we flex hours shifts ways that they can work but primarily the, the the key thread for me is choice and that means that you do have to provide the choice you've just described because i completely agree with you working a lot right now with early careers people entering the workplace um, yeah, it's first of all, it's daunting. Mm. Second of all, you need that connection, that mentoring, that nourishment. You need that most when you start in your career, right? And you and you don't have experience yet, and you being isolated at home. Also, you might not physically have. We have that with some of us. You, you might not be able. You might be in a house share. You know, it physically might not be possible for you. And um, then come back to the social play part of work as well. You know, my early career in 
in central London. Some of the best years of my life. We're, yeah. we're, we're finishing, going straight to the pub. And Forming relationships. You know, yeah. it's really important to happiness at work. So I think it's a really interesting time to how this will, right. how it evolves and what, what is wanted from, from different people in the workplace, different generations of the workplace. And the choice is the key, I think. Yeah, yeah having choice. The quicker you treat someone like an adult, the quicker they act like an adult. Yeah. Um, it's hard for, we had this conversation the other day, a friend of mine, it's hard for people to start because most people will have come from an education background, whatever that, wherever that may have stopped, it might have been a school leaver, university, yeah. whatever. Doesn't, education, this is again a whole number yeah, of the books. Books. Education has very little success in the UK in encouraging great ways that people will enter the workplace. Yeah. It doesn't treat adults. It doesn't treat children like progressive yeah. young adults. It doesn't help you self do anything really. It's, yeah, discipline or... it's often dictatorial, autocratic, and you do it my way while you're in the education establishment. So yeah. when people arrive at work, they expect to be treated probably quite similar. Yeah. So for me, and I'm quite passionate about this, how you treat people in early careers will dictate how they act in the workplace in the future. It's really interesting. So it's a great never it's a great opportunity. If, if you I was really lucky. My starting um career, the culture I worked in was a fantastic place. And it means my expectation from work is high, really high. And what I want to give to others is of the same standard. Yeah. So it's a really important part of early careers development is giving people the best understanding of a great way of working. That's amazing. Great advice there, I think. Um, talking about your career quickly, because um, maybe, you know, all of our seven listeners may, may be in a relatively <laughs> similar field. Um, but uh, we, you've recently moved uh, to a, a sort of a CPO role. Yeah. Um, top of the food chain, if you like. Um, how do you, how, how has that transition been? How, how do you, what's the, what's it's been? Purifying. I can imagine. Um, and, and actually, just to that point, if of interest to people, I don't have a traditional HR background either. Yeah. So for me, that's another quite interesting part. And, and Ben mentioned about cultural evolution. I wouldn't have been the leader of choice in historic times at our organisation and others potentially. And yeah. that's, that's an interesting factor. It's actually a sh sign that the culture's changed. Yeah. And, well, and also the, the faith, I guess, in, in, in trying something different. So, so my background is, is communication and change and business transformation rather than traditional HR. I mean, I've worked within a HR function for the last seven years of, of my yeah. time there. So, I, so I've had a lot of familiarity with that, but I don't, I haven't gone from being, you know, a HR generalist to a, then a business partner and then to a HR manager and onwards and onwards. So it's not been a linear career like that. And I would say that, again, in both, I've only had two organisations that I've worked for, this and, and one before it. Mm. And I would say the reason, A, I stayed at both and B... I've progressed is that both companies valued internal mobility yeah. and and I valued internal mobility and wanting to contribute to yeah. adding value to the organization. And that, you know, I think it's really important that you have to care about your career as much as the company that you work for, right? Yeah. Um, it can't be just one of the two. Uh, it has to be both. And I think that what I've learned so far is that I knew absolutely nothing, even though I'd watched the awesome person before me do this job for a long time and it, and it helped me see it was possible for me for me to do it but you know we were joking earlier when I arrived we were talking about a comment back Barack Obama made when he became um, president I love that I'm putting myself in the company yes I always wanted to do this live on a podcast but he said that when he became president his first day was like well I'm going to sort all this stuff out because everyone before me just you know they didn't bother well they weren't very effective at it and I'm just going to be better and I wasn't quite in that space, but I, I definitely was very idealistic. Yeah, yeah. And I probably still am quite an idealistic, optimistic person. And then all of the other people bring me back down to earth and remind me that that's ridiculous. There's all these challenges. Yeah, yeah, get yeah. out of the Disney world. <laughs> but, um, but Without I, having that vision and that idealistic yeah. mindset, though, you, you, what are you aiming towards? You know? So I think it helps with resilience. <laughs> yeah. Because I think one of the things I would say as a, as a, a chief people officer or somebody in this field you look after everybody, right? Yeah. So you're the, you're the business partner to the leadership team that drives the business. You're the person that works with all the people. You know, you have you have to have a lot of resilience because when everyone else is down, the people and culture function has to say, it's fine. Yeah. We're going to get you all out of this. You know, we're going to deal with furlough. We're going to yeah. deal with COVID. We're going to deal with this organisational change. We're going to make sure all of this works yeah. with you, but we're partnering, we'll help you, we'll use our expertise. So... I would say that a big 
plug to lots of people in the people and culture environment at my company others is you have to really keep your chin up when yeah. everyone else is on the floor. Yeah. And to Ben's point earlier, you're never going to keep everyone happy. Oh, no. And oh, I'll often... tell you now we don't. <laughs> <laughs> and you're often the people that get the, you know, the finger pointed oh, yeah. at um, because you are you are the ones that are there to keep everyone happy. And so you're always going to have 10, 20 percent of your organization that are like grumbly. And, and you've got to sort of remain positive in that, in light of that. Yeah. And that, I guess... I'm always really in awe of, of people, people, um, people, team, people, because you have to wear, you have to wear a lot because you are going back to empathy. That's going to have to be a huge thing. So you have to be the, the motivator and the leader, but at the same time, regardless of role, you have to be the friend. You have to be the agony yeah. aunt. You have to be that you're the one holding the, the lawyer. Sometimes yeah. that was a fun one. <laughs> Absolutely. Because you have to be that disciplinarian, but at the same time you have to be the motivator and the confidant that's that must be hard and sometimes those hats that you have to wear are in two meetings that are back to back in the space of two hours yeah so it's it, it must be difficult so that resilience must be the, i mean that's got to be one of the core skills right of, definitely of some soft skills come through again <laughs> yeah not so skills not so yeah. soft are they <laughs> Look, traditionally that is probably why traditional hr teams were were made up of, of women, right? Absolutely. Uh, and I think when women, again, traditionally, not so much now, but I, I think, and this is definitely an assumption or an educated assumption, when people have got to, or women have got to your role, they've often had to demonstrate quite masculine characteristics, right? In order to, there's going to, I'm going into a board meeting and there's going to be blood splattered on the wall and I have to earn my, earn my space there. I think it's changed now, right? Oh, definitely. I, I think it's I think it's in transit. So I would say there's one more depressing reason why there's a lot of women in the HR field is because people weren't valued. Yeah. So you'll often see a lot of women working in roles where it's not necessarily valued as much. Teaching, caregiving, yeah. Yeah. HR in the business world. I would say the big shift there is that the strategic nature of HR has has evolved hugely yeah. and the necessity for people has become something even the most autocratic, difficult CEOs of an organization get. Can't get away from yeah. and, yeah. and I think that seeing how it informs business strategy and how you partner and, and that people who understand years and years of business from a people perspective still understand years and years of business. Yeah. They understand go-to-market strategies. They understand how things need to work. They understand operational effectiveness and efficiencies. They've lived through all those business experiences just from a people lens, yeah. right? So again, it gives another angle. So if, one of the best examples I use, if you think about going into a, a merger or acquisition, if you go through a whole due diligence and you ignore culture and people, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> how do you so integrate those two it, things? Exactly. So having a representative that's thinking from that lens in the mix of that dis debate, discussion and decision making Good to see a real change to how successful those are because not yeah. many of them are actually, yeah. particularly when you merge different cultures and companies. So I think there is a real, I, I don't think we're there yet to your point. I yeah. think it's an opportune time and it's something that's really exciting. I mean, about huge strides towards yeah. a better world in that sense. I mean, we've seen, you know, uh, shifts from the your traditional HR to a bigger people focus over the last few years as well. I mean, We've had lots of TA professionals on the on on the the podcast, and uh, talent acquisition and and people have become a core element uh, uh, having a real voice at some of those tables because without a you know HR in its in its typical or a traditional sense is more legal, right? It's the it's the the, the policy making yeah. legal aspects, hey, people, policy yeah. procedure, yeah. Whereas people is a much bigger element and of, of a business way yeah. more complex um, and probably way more um in tune to its success as a, as an organization without without the the, the, the people elements um you, you're not gonna if you don't have a happy workforce if you don't have a motivated workforce if you don't have an engaged workforce are you going to achieve the business objectives for this year for the next 10 years probably not um and it's really nice to see that you know, the the people in our space are, are getting the recognition uh, that they deserve at the table that they should be seat, seated at. I think because also, and I know we've talked about it a few times when we've been discussing today, but if you think about 
separate to business success or meeting business objectives, do you want to show up every day and have a really miserable time? Because that's your life, you know? So say most people's career span, which for my generation is probably going to be till I'm about 85, but... um. You know, you work for a really long time. Yeah, you get about you sp- 15 years off at the end. Yeah, and you spend a, you spend a lot of time doing it, right? Yeah. So if it doesn't if it doesn't speak to your purpose, your passion, to your enjoyment, that's blah. that's quite miserable, yeah, isn't, it? isn't it? As an existence. So, yeah. So so if you're not thinking in your business planning about the people that you work with and the enjoyment you derive from work, separate to achievement, success goals. Yeah. Then it won't probably work overall. Is that get your point yeah. in terms of success? But also, it won't be a great time. Yeah, a uh, shit time. Yeah, coming yeah. to coming to work. I hope everyone has a good time, right? Not. Yeah. And and that doesn't mean it's not difficult. It doesn't mean it's not challenging. It doesn't mean that it's not it's not tough. But ideally, my you mentioned DVP earlier. I want my company to be an employer of choice for the yeah. people that work there and for the people that don't yet work there. Yeah. That means. It has to be quite nice, right? Yeah. If you want a better term. Yeah. Otherwise, the rest of it kind of doesn't really work. Yeah. Stress and, and all of that, that's okay. But you want those, you want that that sense of like, oh, I'm getting somewhere with this. And I, first, I think even as a leader who wants to achieve X and, and Y, you want to do it with a smile on your face. You want to do it with people around you that you enjoy working with. So I think it's really, really important. Yeah. And learning. I think if you look again, Go for life longevity. We'll use that one. People who are constantly active and learning and keeping themselves developing and developed tend to live longer because you're interested. And I mean, I'm discounting all genetic issues you might have and any tragedy that may befall you. But overall, all those things are good as well. It is having an active mind and continuing to develop as a person. And, And I think coming back to the work for me. They say you should have friends of all different generations. That's the same at work, right? You need all that experience. You need that diversity. Different generations, different ethnicities, different genders. That that works as a as a cultural contribution from different voices will help you drive forward a business in a better way. I wanted to, and again, this was something when we worked together that I think we were starting to to build internally a brand. I think. The, the people team always had like a strap line and I always remember it. It was the ability to leave, but the desire to stay. Um, and I think that was pretty much all we had from an internal brand point of view. The values were all over the place. Like we kind of enacted that that plan or that project to even just create some, some graphical representations of values right back then. Yeah. I'm not sure if the values have changed. but um, No, nope. company values are the same. Which is great. Which in a period of cultural change and or cultural evolution, to stay true to those values, I think it's quite... The values can be, yeah. could have been easy to, to just change them. So, right, as of today, yeah, clean slate, we're doing this. It doesn't change anything, really, does it? Like, changing the strapline values of a business, it's how people perceive them, or it's how they're rewarded or recognised against them yeah, and I, that, that really... And I think, cause you just reminded me about that programme of work, and it, obviously, global organisations are also influenced by our, by our um, global... Uh, direction but what's interesting I would say if I reflected back on that we we did have values but did we understand what that meant yeah. in terms of actually how they embedded and I think that's the key shift in the global yeah. organization as well I'm not just being for the UK like some of the work in other European um, countries and, and also within um, Japan amazing in terms of actually how that's advanced and developed but yeah. it I know you're thinking about this and I know I'm fascinated by employer branding overall because it's so difficult for it not to be an amazing visual campaign, imagery, yeah. et cetera. And I don't know if you guys get it, but I will get Google quoted at me so much. Like, it's just amazing to work at Google. Is it? Yeah. Do you work there? Have you ever worked there? Yeah. I've seen all their videos. That tells me they've got a fantastic marketing team. Yeah. <laughs> it does, I don't know what it's like to work at Google because I don't work there. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I, I'm interested in your thoughts on branding for, from that perspective in terms of um, I, I think it comes back to our initial points around marketing that mm. you can you can make a business look as great as you want it to and you can put it in front of the people that you think you want to work for that business. Marketing, branding, well, marketing and branding are two very separate things, right? But the science of marketing is putting a product in the place where you think people are going to buy it. Yep. Um, but we, as our organisation, we are more, um, we're more, brand first Mm -hmm. i think we're starting to be more marketing led but we've been very brand brand heavy in this and not by brand i don't mean 
logos and colors and put some values on the wall, tick, done that. We're branding in the sense that we want to create value and we want to create awareness and ultimately we want to create love, right? If you go straight to the point of marketing without creating any value, marketing is extracting value, right? Brand is creating it. Yep. And I think the same applies for internal branding as it does for consumer branding, right? If you immediately say, these are our values, they're now on the wall, they look lovely, mm. like read them every time you're eating your lunch, read that. Mm. Then and believe it, believe, believe it. it, and live it. it sounds like the USA. Every sounds like the American national anthem. Every yeah. time there's a company, say it seven times a day, and you'll believe yeah. it. <laughs> every time there's a company roadshow, and we're, we're quite guilty of this, but these are the values, and you put them up on every side. Like that's that's not going to work. Your internal brand or your EVP, it has to live. Right, it has right. to be this living, embedded. living, breathing, embedded thing. Yeah. That if you if I sat back as a as a brand professional and said, right, job done, uh, what a naive thing to do. Because you can never, same with culture, same with branding, it has to evolve. Every person that enters your business will tweak and change your EVP. Yeah. Right? And and that's because they'll be looking for something else. They'll they'll share some skills. And contribute something else as well. 100%. Um, so I think an EVP has to constantly, you can't contain it. Same as our, our brand, we, we've we set some longer term brand objectives, but in the short term, I don't, I don't want to set any objectives around our brand because I don't, I, I don't know. Mm. And I want it to grow and ultimately brand visually shouldn't be subjective, but how it lands is very much subjective. Mm. And I think that's the same internally, right? Mm. You, you cannot control, you're delivering a, a kind of address to 200 people in the business. Every single person, regardless of how you say it, every single person is going to take something different from that, yeah. right? So if, if you think that your brand is set and it's done and this is what we do, then it's just never going to work. Your values should be and you should live by them. And we adopt a very servant leader approach. So we try to be um, quite relatable as leaders because, again, we don't want that hierarchical nature. We don't want to be the disciplinarians or to be too dictatorial. So our our brand is one of inclusivity and being relatable and I feel like I've probably just not answered the question. I've just, I, just to add, exactly to, add to, to that, that there's, yeah. that there's, said. So there's a level of, going back to your point, Gemma, about, um, you know, you, you, the Google videos look nice. And, and I've met, you know, we've had people that joined our business from Google. Yes, win. <laughs> Everyone loves to promote that. Don't they? <laughs> they were at Google, but now uh, they're here. Um, but the, the, the videos may be very different to, to the reality. Um, and as an employee, employer brand approach, I think, it depends on what you're looking to achieve. I think if you're just looking to achieve lots of people through the door, then make it. You may you may have an approach that the the, the business, the, the employer brand is perceived to be X, Y, and Z. But for me, I think the best way employer brand should support the people goals of the organisation. Um, and if if you're looking at it from a talent acquisition or a people acquisition perspective, be authentic because you're probably going to drive a long. Uh, you know. When people on board, they're more likely to stay past six yeah. and twelve months. If you, you know, if we put up a um, lots of, if we was to start promoting employer branding in a way where people are in this really fancy office, and that you know, there's it, there's lots of we're a remote business. You're, you're going to spend most of your time at home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's tra so transparency. And it's transparency and authenticity. Is is definitely exactly that one of transparency. So we made the decision very quickly that any of that outwardly facing marketing materials or inwardly facing we would never use a stock image mm -hmm. so when you look on our linkedin or on our website every image <laughs> one of the research steps. this now yeah. they may not <laughs> still <laughs> us, but they were well, every image is, what is, is of our people because yeah. we want to celebrate that that transparency and that yeah. authenticity to harry's point if we did something and there's people around a, a boardroom with a New York skyline behind them in suits, high fiving over a PowerPoint, that is not that's not our business. Yeah. And at the same time, we're quite mindful that when we do put out videos and, and stuff of meetups that we have, it it does look fun, but fun is it's a very short lived emotion, yeah. right? Yeah. You if you join a business purely on fun, you've probably you probably misaligned in actually what you want. Like so 
it's it's hard. Is I guess what I'm trying to say. So, but I think also the point you made earlier about it changes. So do people, right? So yeah. You might have somebody join you. And so do companies. Yeah. You're a young company, and yeah. you know things have changed aggressively for us yeah. you know, over the last four years. Um, whereas it, obviously it's going to be a lot more stable. Change is going to be uh, a longer term thing in a company like KM, right? Well, it's yes and no. I, I guess. I mean, overall, yes, probably because you haven't got the freedom and the initial startup approach yeah. that that you have and can establish but then you'll age right so you will mature and you'll, you'll need to do something different for you as a business and yeah and also your people <laughs> so coming back to people change that you might have somebody join you early careers very much it's about the vibrancy and the things that you yeah. describe but then it will quickly potentially for them become about another stage in the employee life cycle for them or their career stage and that might be about stability or growth or progression or, or other things they didn't initially choose an organization for yeah and i think that's what becomes quite difficult i think i think evp overall is a fascinating topic yeah. in terms yeah. of of how you you mentioned it how are you congruent so how do you represent visually how do you in an interview process actually really yeah. play what it's yeah. like to work here really good point actually. yeah because because i know that i i mean my team joke with me about it but i i get really excited about people you know if i'm yeah. interviewing someone and they're like really awesome i'm just like please come and work here and then the danger is I tell them it's amazing. Like, no problem here because I want them, you know, and I want them to choose us. But yeah. actually you have to be, I, I have to recognize with some people that some of the things that might be really valued by them, I need to give them the choice there and then, right? Yeah. To say, oh, it's, it, you sound like you want to be really regularly in an office for X amount. Of, let me just be clear about this this side of our organization. Or it sounds like you're coming from a very slick organization where We're this not. happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and that might not be the case. You, know, you, you have to really, I think it comes back to that point around is give people the choice with True. the honesty yeah. and then they will come with the view. They know. But also the real reality is no one knows what it's like to work anywhere until, yeah. until they're there. Yeah, and then the more you can give them up front, the better because you're you're giving them the most informed. You know, if you start somewhere and you think oh, I did say that, um, they're more likely to continue giving it a go. If it was like she said, it was amazing. You hear? <laughs> she lied. <laughs> it is amazing. <laughs> um, but actually, um, I think you know, a, a secondary to that, you're actually gonna you're you're using another uh, crucial skill in in like. Uh, honesty right um and actually if i was looking at, at joining an organization and and i've got two one saying it's amazing and and they're really selling to all the reasons where i want to work with them one saying look we really try but these are some of the issues that are in our organization and these are some of the things that we're trying to do to to improve it i'm i'm, I'm initially going to be led towards the person that's just being honest yeah because that's you know in companies that i've worked at in the past i think honesty transparency ha have not always been at the forefront of yeah, the agenda and 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 actually um knowing that i can work somewhere where things no company's going to be perfect this amazing place is probably not amazing yeah well nothing uh, is perfect nothing is perfect and, yeah so I, I would at least rather take a bet on the person that's willing to be honest with me and so i think it's really important i think the other part as well you were talking about how you stand out right so the other side is you do have to give people a vision in the market of what of what your company is right yeah and and you can't do some of the more de deep stuff we've just described yeah. until you're in dialogue with someone yeah. right so it's kind of that early part of it is how do i show you that you might want to choose me it's a bit like a dating world isn't it yes yeah. how do you swipe right and come to this company then the real depth of That's choice yeah exactly <laughs> and then the good choice the real depth of choice comes from asking more than one person at the organization understanding and getting a chance to really really see it but I think the important part that you said right from the start is that it has to be what it feels like to work there, not just what it looks like yeah, yeah. visually. And values don't mean anything, however great they are, however much time spent on defining them. If you look left and think, mm, one of those values, that's weird. You said it was inclusivity and I feel absolutely excluded in every conversation. And that that doesn't ring true to me because then you, you have effectively sold someone something and you can't really recover from that very easily no. it's 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 better they walked past you thinking it wasn't for me than they thought it was for me but really you you lied you know yeah. and i think it's a difficult it's a really competitive market right now for talent so i think a lot of companies potentially that have been more congruent with their evp could be at risk in that these more challenging times of really upping the ante of what they've got on offer and normally to your point earlier that looks like higher reward so yeah. There's been a lot of people post-pandemic really throwing high salaries out there yeah. to encourage people. To, and now 
there's a lot of examples some very highly po profiled ones of having to cut jobs which for me is one of it's not an ideal scenario if you if you were really good workforce planning you shouldn't be losing people six months after recruiting them ideally uh, yeah so we, we've spoken about that a lot on a number of these podcasts in terms of particularly in our industry or our kind of related field, industry of, yeah. of tech and, and particularly big big tech that the shine that a Google or a Twitter or a Meta might have had and um, they were stable they were stable yeah. and the EVP was one of stability right? yeah. you'd go there and it would be amazing and you can go down the slide and have your lunch but everyone wanted to look down that slide everyone wanted to slide yeah. I want to work from a ball pit or whatever so like that <laughs> That's what I. That's the law. Get anything done? Yeah, that's all we're all just children at heart. Yeah, really, that's, that's the key. It's like adults. We're all kids. Yeah, exactly. Or we're really tired because the sleep pods. Are, yeah, yeah like, definitely. Yeah, you're kicking off because the sleep pods broke. Definitely. Uh, but I think that that has started to go because they um, it, as as amazing as it might have been, stability is something I think really that every everybody looks for, and it might be something. It might be a secondary desire because again, like the the look or the financial reward or whatever might take precedent but I think ultimately you're joining a new business for st stability right because again you want to feel like you belong so the the glamour has probably gone from some of those really big organizations unfortunately or maybe it's down to bad planning but, or, or whatever but I think that is the the stability narrative and the longevity of a role and the development and the growth that it can offer you I, I think they are they are way out out way in salary now and the financial that yeah. reward that it's a total reward package i think yeah. and, and that for me extends to what what it what it means for your choice your flexibility yeah. and and your your purpose and your and your enjoyment at work 100 percent. i think those elements are expected being discussed being shaped if they're not in existence and and it's a really positive time for the workplace i would say yeah. the workspace because it might not be a place very true. I think your I think your EVP needs to be um needs to be changing with the times. I think if if people haven't looked at their EVP in the last three years, they definitely should be doing yeah. that because you can't just be selling the same job um that you did three years ago. If you if you and and the likelihood is you're not selling the job that you're actually offering um because you're probably offering a lot more flexibility than you did three years ago and. And actually listening to what the, the talent market wants mm. and then, you know, deciding whether that's a, a di you, you're not going to just change for every, every you know, every time there's a little uh, trend out there and I want to work from home on it. You can't just ch constantly be changing. But if there is a, a general change in the talent market where people are looking for, you know, at the moment, obviously there's a, a demand for more flexibility and choice. If you're not offering that, then you're, you're probably at a massive disadvantage to your competitors. Um, and so including or improving your EVP to, to go with times is, is actually crucial. I agree. Um, uh, it's, it's about, I think now, if there's one thing to take away for if you're building an EVP, it's, it's be honest, right? I think yeah. to, exactly to your point, Harry, at saying we're trying is arguably now better than we've done it and we're amazing at it. And yeah. I think that, that, that honesty the narrative around honesty and being really transparent and knowing that we're not the full package but we really want to and you can come along on that journey with us and you can help us deliver these results i think that is de and i is one of the one of the the biggest culprits of that for, for organizations you often see people you know talking about oh yeah diversity and inclusion that's like top of our you know that's we're, we're really good on that that's we're smashing that but what they mean is we're really trying. We want to be better, but people are so scared to say we're actually not very diverse and we're actually lacking in this in this inclusivity piece. And we know that people in our organisation aren't include, you know, don't feel included. But and that that but piece is really yeah. important. And, and I think also like back to the honesty piece. If if you're looking at diverse equity and inclusion, and you think any organisation will have got that done, good luck with that because societal. <laughs> challenges and issues if you just take gender as an example you, wow. you know which i'm more familiar with when, with other, is fundamentally what's really challenging is if you look to diverse organization um from a male female uh, perspective there is huge societal parameters that have dictated and have led us to the place that we are currently yeah so to get out of that and it's actually worsened since the pandemic so actually to get to to change that in an organization revolutionary and say that you've done that I'd definitely like to have conversations with yeah. them who is there to achieve that because 
it's it's not and there's definitely there is examples where there is much more improvement across the board but i think that it's an advancement right it's yeah. really fantastic necessary advancement that it is being considered and is on Absolutely. i think in top four strategic priorities for for different cpos dei will be on there thank goodness yeah. because it's been absent for far too long yeah but is it a finished priority no and no, none of the, none of the others are either and never will be is no. the point we're making but the effort to be prioritizing that and yes. actively changing rather than awareness there's been a lot of years of awareness so a lot of awareness it's a lot of awareness action is is the difference of, yeah. of, of change so yeah there's a lot but i think the honesty piece around evp is really critical it was like a nice segue into doing our completely original not plagiarized <laughs> ending of the um End of the pod. The bother who? Yeah. So, um, as I'm sure everybody knows, I say everybody, the seven people. <laughs> um, we might have got eight now. Yeah, maybe. We, um, Jeff, she, she's got a big poll. Big, <laughs> they're following. Jeff, yeah, they got a big following. Um, we're getting 18 now. <laughs> yeah. So, it, our previous guest has asked you a question. So, who is the one person you admire within your space and what would you ask them if they were here today? Well, <laughs> Great question. Just the one person. Um, now, interestingly, the probably the most I would say is in admiration and learning from. They wouldn't necessarily be determined as being traditionally in my space, i.e., that they they have never been a CPO. Mm. And it, yep. but, and I mentioned this person we were talking earlier, but Brene Brown is somebody who, in reading her research, her social science. And her advanced thinking around how you address the imperfections and how you look at the negativity of shame, the negativity of not being open and talking and connecting and having all the things we've talked about, inclusive, yeah. inclusivity, community, et cetera. I would say that that's had a huge influence on my own thoughts of how you develop people and culture strategies. There's multiple people like her, but she's probably a very notable person that she has a fantastic way of, I would say, encapsulating that research and making it relevant in a in a pure business sense as well. There's yeah. fantastic examples of how she's done that, a reference to leadership. Yeah. But I think that considering well, there's a lot of ways that I look at people and culture from a you know, looking at top employers trend data, looking at internal understandings and networks and voices but that kind of social science and real psychological angle of it has been very integral i would say to some of my own thinking and shaping amazing you know, what would you ask her what would i ask her does she ever get tired <laughs> <laughs> because in truth what i mean is to explore the subjects that she's explored it's quite hard yeah. And how does how does she consider you draining? Yeah, and and how and, and I'd ask many people like her who've got that level of then because once people have this, they are a notable person. They're someone to be admired. The reality of that is there's a high level of expectation. Expectation. And I just I would probably ask a lot around how does she manage that personally. I'd be interested in her personally rather than try and glean any more of her expertise. So a question would probably centre around. Look. Tell me a bit about you, Brene. If be like that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for uh, for spending some time with us, and and it's been amazing. The the conversation has been brilliant. Um, there's been some amazing takeaways that I personally am going to go and have a look at uh, for for our business as well. But thanks, Gemma. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Um, and we're good to go. And they bring different skill sets. You know, every yeah. person has a different skill set, different experience. They, you know, they have different knowledge as well to share. So, you know, what what four people might come up with one person might come up with a better idea but it might work differently right so it's good to have that variety of mindsets and skills for this type of for sure uh group yeah 